I come here not as a specialist on Europe like these folk uh, who are come very well credentialed to talk to you about aspects of detail and I, I think over the last few days you've been well immersed in a very drilled down detail about facts and issues. I come as a, in a sense, a late student of Europe. Um, I'm somebody who's become quite spellbound by the idea of Europe. So I talk from a, a point of passion that I'm sort of hoping I'll share with you. And I think, in a way, that's the thing that will engage students. If you can find it in yourselves, if you can find an anchor point within Europe, you will sort of get into the subject. Now, what I'm going to display up here is near wallpaper. It's an abstraction, but it's just something in case you find me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> My feeling is that there is a problem in Australia with regard to Europe. It's not just the media, although we're certainly amongst the biggest culprits. The pervasive attitude in Australia is that Europe is a history subject. Europe represents the past, Asia is the future. We've got Europe under control, we can tick the European box and move on. The problem with this is from everything. To so casually dismiss Europe as a legacy region, static and easily understood, is folly. And there are some clear and urgent region, the reasons why this attitude should bother every one of us, especially in the education sector. The first is that Europe never stopped morphing. The current state of flux is as radical now as it was at the end of the Cold War 23 years ago. The immediate economic meltdown is a major part of this state, but in many ways it only goes to accentuate a massive, ongoing and very restless existential crisis in Europe. But I'm not really using the word crisis in a negative way. Europe is changing shape. Um, within that, there are myriad identity issues, and the result has been widespread, active, and very healthy debate over who Europe is and who the current individual countries are within that larger region. In the past four years, Lynn Gallagher and I have travelled to Europe on three occasions. In 2009, we went to Paris to pursue some research that I was undertaking as part of the State Library of Victoria Creative Fellowship. And though on that trip we weren't there as radio program makers, it sort of goes with the territory that we're curious and we watch and we observe. <laughs> It was already a few years into the GFC and the uncertainty and anger was obvious on the streets as we found ourselves caught up in protest rallies and lockouts from live bits that we were trying to access. <laughs> the French public sector was beginning to shrink in the crisis and the easiest targets were, of course, cultural institutions. A year later, we were back in Europe. Lynn had been fortunate enough, as Vaseline said, to receive an EU Journalism Award. I accompanied her as technical handbag. <laughs> <laughs> and we raced like lunatics through seven <laughs> member states in five weeks, from Estonia and Finland in the east to the UK in the west, recording material for a radio series on the fate of European culture in the wake of the GFC. The series was called The Art of Being Europe. We'd only been there one year earlier, the ground had shifted quite markedly in that time. Paris was a different place, and across the whole of the region, the European project was being tested, strained, and examined. As a part of this, we found ourselves in Tallinn, the capital of Estonia, at midnight on New Year's Eve 2010. As the country switched its currency to the euro, and Tallinn became one of the European capitals of culture for a year. <laughs> Estonia was excited, and in spite of the wider economic crisis, Estonians seemed in no doubt, and I'm not shut that up, um, <laughs> Estonia was excited, and in spite of the wider economic crisis, Estonians seemed in no doubt as to why they were joining the Eurozone. For countries on the eastern fringe of Europe, the memory of the Cold War and of having your own culture and identity denied to you 
was still very fresh. For them, European Union is a model of relative calm and of cultural diversity. It's what can happen when people actively agree to rally together and create a new paradigm for peace and mutual respect. We found that as much as the countries of Eastern Europe were unambiguous champions of the EU, countries further west were showing increasing signs of complacency and torpor. For country, the places like the UK and France, the memory of war and serious unrest is much more distant and consequently the value of European Union as a mechanism not just for economic unity, but as a bulwark for peace has been nearly forgotten. And as much as people can build this thing called Europe into a place of high ideals, they can equally build it into a far less edifying state of being. And if they stop believing in the idea of Europe altogether, it will crash to the ground in a disaster of failed ambition, ignorance, laziness, and in the worst cases, toxic, toxic nationalism and violence. The European Union has some inner strengths, some structural features and wisdom that make it tougher and more durable than it might seem at first glance. It doesn't mean that everything that Europe does is smart or appropriate, doesn't mean that they don't in fact get some things terribly wrong, but if these stumbles mixed with a determined desire to improve the region for everyone, that's the stuff of progress and it's what we learn from. And this in a way leads me to the second reason that we should be caring enough to watch Europe like hawks. The point of understanding facets of identity is crucial. Germany for example, shares its borders with nine other countries. And when you consider that distances in Europe are tiny compared to Australia, that means that in a few hours by train in any direction, you cross into another place with another culture, history, and language. And these boundaries are utterly permeable, effortless to cross. It's one of the great tricks that helps to unify Europe but it's also a challenge for the sovereign psyches of the individual member states. Compare that to Australia. How many international borders do we share? <laughs> if we did have another country physically attached with a different language, traditions and beliefs, would we display the same respect and equanimity that modern European countries show to their neighbours? Well, in a way, we do share borders with many hundreds of indigenous nations across the country we've pretty much failed the test of how to deal with all those internal cross-cultural differences. So perhaps we're not as sophisticated as we'd like to tell ourselves. But this issue of identity is a bit of a clincher in our increasingly globalised world. Um, we tend to be a bit binary in our conception of identity. The government's release last year of the white paper on the Asian century seemed to confirm what the media propagates and what many people have fixed in their mind. We're part of Asia now, we're not European anymore. This is patently daft. The idea that you have to be one or the other makes no sense. We know in our own lives we can have private identity, a family identity, a work identity, a public identity, and an identity as Australians and global citizens. Our heads don't exactly explode just because we're carrying all these different ideas of ourselves. Of course, we have an evolving identity in the Asian region. This doesn't preclude our still being home to myriad U European cultural traditions, systems of government, and family connections, languages, memories, and ongoing relationships. That's part of what multiculturalism is. It's just a shame that our inability to understand that fully prevents us from being truly cosmopolitan. But my point is this. With all of our European inheritance, why on earth are we not paying closer attention to what's happening in Europe? How Europe copes with unfolding cultural and economic change must be used as part of the key to how Australia moves ahead. There's so much detail and nuance in European behaviour and events that we're overlooking because we feel we've moved on from that story, but we haven't, we mustn't. Every time I return to Europe, I'm amazed at the subtle changes 
alongside all of the more obvious tectonic shifts. I know as teachers that you can't necessarily alter the trajectory of overarching curriculum trends, but you can make Europe as alive and as relevant as it really is in the way that you choose your words in the classroom and through your own curiosity and attention. European languages are still important. I'm still trying, to, I'm currently trying to learn German because I think it's valuable to my work and my world. I was actually at the Goethe Institute, I think, just after you guys were there the other day. As well, European politics is utterly riveting and it's properly tapped into. And when you find the right source of, of information, European history is what's happening right now and will continue to happen. Europe never stopped being great stories. We've just got to become better storytellers. Thank you. Well done. Thank you.